Hi, my name is Conrad Allen, and I have been reenacting since 2011, and I've been coming up to Cognac since then, too. So I portray a member of the French Resistance uh, for a reenactment group called the Maquis de Britannia. And what we portray is a specific part of the French Resistance, which was called the Maquis. The Maquis is the French word for um, the scrub or the hills. And what it refers to in World War II were groups of uh, usually young French men and women who hid in the forests um, and then sort of formed camps there to hide from the Germans and then later to begin resisting uh, the German occupation. And so during D-Day, uh, what these groups did was they tried to help the Allied landings uh, by conducting sabotage operations um, to uh, tie up uh, German logistics and German troops behind the beaches. So that while Allied troops were landing and doing the fighting, the French resistance were behind the lines trying to uh, hamper the German war effort in any way they could. So what we would do what the Maquis would do during uh, D-Day was they would um, blow up uh, bridges or telephone lines, they would try and sabotage German lines of communication, they would um, try and stop German reinforcements from reaching the beach. There was one very famous um, incident where a German uh, SS Panzer Division, the uh, Das Reich Division, was based in the south of France and was trying to get up to Normandy to help stop the landings. And McKee groups held up the division on its way to, uh, to Normandy. It was, a, um, it was a journey that would usually take two or three days for the tanks to get from the south of France to Normandy. But because the McKee uh, held up the um, division so much by blocking the road, by shooting at German troops, by trying to destroy the German tanks. It actually ended up taking the Germans three weeks to get to Normandy, so that by the time they got there, the Allies had already established a considerable beachhead. So the resistance mostly helped the D-Day landings, not by directly confronting the German army, but by trying to slow it down and make it harder for the Germans to work behind the lines. Bonjour, I'm Corey, uh, this is Ozzy. Dane and Conrad, and we're going to talk today about the drop canisters and supplying uh, for the French resistance during the D-Day operation in 1944. Um, to start, uh, the canister and the supply operation the British and the Americans provided to the French were done in multiple ways. Uh, they sent, this is just a reproduction of one of the styles of canisters that they sent, um, but there were many varieties filled with different things. And uh, they also did supply drops through uh, airfield landings or uh, sometimes in just a farm, a farm field. They would land and drop things out of the airplane and take off again. Um, they were filled with cigarettes, uh, clothing items, um, am ammunition, depending on what uh, uh, unit they were supplying. They could have given them something of more priority like explosives or uh, uh, um, anti-tank weaponry. But um, this is our... Uh, representation of that uh, it's we we have it filled with some British uh, weapons that were commonly sent to the various units in Normandy um, we have a, a Enfield rifle it could have been a, maybe an earlier war model um, that they were kind of surplusing maybe a 1939 or 1940 model mark II uh, or mark ones um, that was chambered in 303. They could have sent the, a little bit of ammunition, which was in a, a, a bandolier, um, a cloth bandolier. They would have shipped those in, in the uh, canisters as well, or in a box that they'd kick out of the side of the uh, airplane. They also supplied uh, pistols, Enfield pistols, or, or sometimes Webley pistols, um, and the various ammunition with those. Um, if a unit was deemed a priority, they could be sent heavier weapons, like uh, Bren machine guns. Um, maybe an older model Bren. Um, now for something like this, the magazines and ammunition would be sent separately or maybe in a, a, an, air, air, an air landing drop. Um, and this would hopefully be accompanied by a training unit. Um, not to say these were the most difficult things to operate, but for a standard French citizen in the countryside of France might not understand or know how to operate one of these. Um, Let's see. Uh, now, one of the most common items that I think, and my personal favorite weapon that was dropped in the French Resistance, was the Mark II Sten. Um, they were sent and dropped uh, 
in large groups and quantities and they were disassembled like this together and wax paper and the guys could come up or our ladies could come come up and open these canisters or open the boxes of stens and quickly assemble them together and then grab their magazines that they would just go fill them at camp with uh, ammunition nine millimeter ammunition and they were ready to fight. Um, they weren't the most reliable, but they were a submachine gun that could be massively produced in a garage in, in England for uh, various units that are fighting in France. Um, and pictures you'd see entire units of French resistance being issued stens or, or Enfield rifles. And like I said, if they were lucky enough with the Bren machine gun. Um, if some units had maybe a little bit more training or had a British liaison or a, maybe a French army liaison, they could be issued some uh, explosives or have some explosives training um, with a, uh, like a Hawkins mine uh, drop canister, maybe even an explosive canister. Um, the gammon bombs, which could be loaded with explosive and thrown at hard objects or, or tanks. Um, or even uh, the simple dynamite that, that you could get at the local mine that maybe some resistance fighters had access to. Dane's going to talk about some captured weapons or, or uh, maybe some utilized French weaponry. Indeed. So if a unit was too deep into France and they couldn't rely on getting uh, reliable airdrops from the British or other allies, they would have two options. First would be to capture German weapons like this K-98. So obviously that would be a bit of a risky situation. You would have to, you'd have to assault a German position. Hopefully you'd find some sort of armory or something where you could deal a large number of weapons very quickly. But that would be one method of how they could have gotten weapons without uh, allied support. The other option is a lot of them did make use of French weapons, a lot of old surplus weapons from World War I, like this Berthier, both in the short carbine version as well as the longer version. These weapons would have been used as well by the German occupying forces, but in smaller numbers. When they invaded France, they would have taken these surplus weapons that were held back by the French army um, for use as uh, for like garrison troops and whatnot. And these would have very easily fallen into the hands of the French resistance through those means. Now we'll move on to uh, Conrad to show us how we might go about getting those weapons in the first place. So. One of the most important tools of the French resistance alongside the weapons were their radios. And I'll turn this around so you can see. So radios would be dropped into the French resistance by the British in canisters like the guns, or they might use uh, civilian radios or uh, French military radios like this one here. This is a French military radio from 1937. So it can uh, pick up communications from England. And what they use these for was to, for one thing, they would send messages to the allies of um, information. Um, so if they witnessed, you know, a German division's movements, they could radio intelligence in London and let them know what they saw. They could tell them about the uh, state of the German defenses on the beaches in Normandy or other information like that. And that was maybe more useful to the Allies than the actual military contribution of the resistance. Um, they also could use these radios to receive messages from England, uh, which would tell them about things like when a weapons drop was coming in, or when a, uh, maybe a, an agent was being dropped into France for them to help. If you've ever seen the movie The Longest Day, then you know that the uh, British would transmit sort of nonsense messages things like John had a long mustache, and these would play um, to resistance groups who would know that they were codes for uh, certain, you know, agents or missions or things like that. Finally, we might have one more interesting weapon to show you, which is a Liberator pistol. This is a 45 caliber single shot pistol, and these were dropped to the French resistance with the idea that you could sneak up behind a German and kill them with this gun and then take an actual useful weapon. Uh, in practice, how useful these were is, uh, I think, a bit uh, ambiguous. I don't think they were that useful. I don't really think they were used very much, but it's an interesting weapon that was used by the French resistance. The last poem, actually, this was the British Enfield 303. It is a number four rifle. These uh, 
were made after the First World War SMLE models, a lighter, more accurate rifle, taking the 303 cartridge, a bolt action rifle with a 10 shot detachable magazine. You can also load it via through stripper clips through the top or a single shot. It also shot the same cartridge as the Bren light machine gun to fill the support rolls. They were a very simple bolt action rifle to use. They cocked on closing, had a rear aperture sight that could be raised for elevation or a combat sight. They did have a bayonet lug on the end of the barrel, but most French troops probably didn't have the bayonets for them. In addition, occasionally a handgun would be involved. This particular one is a British infield, or uh, pardon me, Webley revolver. Uh, it is a break open. It is chambered in 38, 200 caliber. Uh, they would have these um, sometimes, usually not a handgun and a rifle, but you kind of took what you could get. Bonjour, Madame, Messieurs. Uh, I'm Adrian John. I'm the commander of the Makita Breton. We've been reenacting here at Cognac D-Day since 2003. We're really happy to have you do our virtual tour. Thank you for coming.